Welcome back, everyone, to the second episode of Commercial Open Source Office Hours. Um, excited for a new squad of people with hopefully interesting questions. Um, last time we talked a lot about like early repositories and um, just getting started. Um, I'm I can start with like an introducing of myself, introduction of myself. I'm Peter, co-founder of Cal.com, um, and I'm joined by Renan, Tom, and Ben um, with some hopefully interesting open source questions. Um, there's maybe a couple more people joining, but um, I think we can start already. So that's me. I'm working mostly on Calipcom nowadays. I do a very, very small amount of angel investments in open source, um, but pretty much most of my time goes into Calipcom. Um Raynan, do you want to go, for, want to go next? Okay, sounds good. So thank, uh, first, thank you for the opportunity of being here. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm Hena. I'm from. I'm a founder of Scribal Dev. is a, a small bootstrap startup from Brazil. Uh, our mission is to create the best full stack low code platform, and to do that, we strongly believe that we will eventually go to the open source route. And but we have a lot of concerns. Maybe I'm being too closed mind, but I think you are input on, on those will be extremely value for, valuable for us. So the first one would be uh, going this route, going full open source, would it, wouldn't it make it harder to eventually maybe licensing or even selling the company? And thinking about investment and looking for investors, how was your experience with those like, did it make it harder or did you find the right people? So it really depends on your business, to be honest. Um, can you tell me more about the startup again? Yeah, we are a local platform. Uh, so we start from building websites and mobile apps, but we do like automation workflows and AI chats. So. The idea is to be an all-in-one platform to do all the digital, all your digital life, the business digital life. So from when you said, to, you said to, low, low, low code or no code? What did you say? Low code. Yeah, low okay. code. So something like retool in a sense? Yeah. Yes, it's, if... Yeah, so so because retool is mostly to build, it's more for internal, internal dashboards and interface so today we are more we're working more with marketing use case like landing pages and mm -hmm. websites and okay. collecting leads and through forms and integrating with crms and mm -hmm. that kind okay. of stuff interesting well i mean there's definitely a reason to go open source mostly because um i'd say if you're targeting developers you want to make sure that um, you have a product that's just really good for developers and so i think open source has always been um on a you know um, like very accessible for for people for engineers um but um, i mean Licensing wise, so it really depends on who you're selling to, right? Like if you sell, let's say, consumers and prosumers, I think what, from my experience, open source has been pretty hard because when you have a free product that just like does something very, very good for free, uh, it's pretty hard to convince like a consumer to upgrade to something pro-ish. I'm not a big fan of prosumer anyway in the long term. So as long as you find a way to have a free product and but also build a really strong kind of like enterprise muscle and you understand what the enterprise like larger corporations need, um, they most likely never are happy with a free only product. They always need more support and, and SOC 2 and compliance and uh, custom integration. And so I think as long as you find a way to make money in, on, on like the tail end of the market i think it's fine to be open source me personally i've never really seen a business that like didn't work because it was open source like i think if you find something that really works uh, people have always find a way to you know monetize a certain part of that product like i've never heard of a startup founder who says like i wish 
I wish I didn't go the open source route after being wildly successful with my product, right? Like everyone, if you find product market fit, whether it's an open source or in closed source, I think you're onto something, right? And, and nothing else matters than finding product market fit. Like whether you're closed source or open source doesn't really matter. Yeah, yeah makes sense. And we can also go into that topic later. I think other people will probably have a question about that one as well. So Tom, you want to go next? And sorry for butchering your name. I didn't know you were. Uh, where are you from? From Brazil, right? Yes, yeah. Brazil. Okay. Okay. Yeah, my name is complicated. Nobody gets it. <laughs> That's okay. Don't worry. Say, hey, same. I, I have to uh, tell my name many, many times to some people. So, okay. um, Cool. Tom, you want to go next? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm Tom. I'm actually also from Germany. Uh, so greetings from here. Um, I've been coding for about 10 years. Um, professionally, I would say more for like five years. I mm -hmm. started a company pretty young, 18 years old, Tokido in Germany here. Not the best idea funding companies here. Um, initially, just building software for schools to track kind of student progress um, was something I was close to, you know, schools and teachers. Um, it's required by law here. Uh, then drifted more into agency work, helped a lot of startups build, kind of build teams. Um, that's how I got more into learning about building, shipping, scaling, and all the failing of startups. Um, very interesting. So um, then quit that after some time and started just building my own stuff. Um, ended more and more on the route of building kind of an open source alternative to Google Workspace, exploring that. Um, in Germany, it's a very common topic, just data privacy, self-hosting, most business not really having any technical skills. So yeah, that's what I'm doing. And so you said like an alternative to Google Workspace? Or what did you yeah. say? Yeah, so what, what, kind of mail, uh, drive, um, calendar, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Uh, meeting uh, these are like things that I explore mm. also exploring kind of what exists on the market but are other people building a lot of people approaching that yeah um, and I think that also brings me to my next question so or my first question that would be in open source I think I was a part of last stream when do you pair up with other people when it, when does it make sense how do you figure that out like an open source, like you see a good repository, you could see good people working on something, but they might have a different approach, maybe different technology used, maybe different um, philosophy and how to build a product or all that. So mm. I don't think I don't think I've seen that. Can you make an example of someone who's done this in the past? Because I don't really have seen that. Uh, for idea. this case, uh, done, not yet. <laughs> um, mm. I think I only know Omar who's approaching that. There are things like, of course, Nextcloud, OwnCloud, who have parts of the solution. So they're often like parts of the solution. Mm. Yeah, um, I don't know. I don't think I've seen a lot of people like, straight up just combining multiple repos into one thing and being widely successful with that. Typically, you just need to build your own stuff a lot of times. Technical challenges and, and you know, a lot of, yeah, it's just, I think the complexity is, is very hard unless it's like very, very similar code bases and it's, it's low maintenance to keep it up to date. Um, you're basically, if, if, you, if you take an existing repo and you kind of like, batch it into an exist into a new package now you're like a fork technically of said product but you're also a fork of all the other things that you like batch it, packaging in together so you have the challenges of being a single fork which is already really hard multiplied by three repos um so i don't know how you would do that unless you have buy-in from that project and like they help you run that and maintain that um so yeah i don't know if that helps yeah. it does maybe maybe not fully my question though it's also interesting answer i think more of the interesting part is does it make sense to for example build something completely new if there are already some existing solutions to some of the problems i see um, yeah 
Um, in general, I think it depends what you want to do, right? If you want to start a company and you have this really, really strong conviction about a problem and everyone else is doing it wrong, then you should definitely do it yourself. But if you are just, let's say, a consumer or an engineer, you should probably just use what's out there and help make it better. I think open source has always been like, it's, let's make an example with like Node.js versus Bun, right? Like, or, or some other runtimes, like the engineers of Bun could have easily um, just made PRs for Node and, and hope they get it merged. But they've had a fundamental different point of view of how JavaScript runtime should look and work. And so they just started from scratch and rebuilt everything themselves and, and tried to compete on, on, a, on a fundamental same level. So I think it's kind of like build versus buy and buy is like contribute to open source. It's like, it really depends if you want to be part of a larger community and then you contribute, or if you want to say, okay, I'm doing it completely different. Um, and, and, and um, I'm starting my own project. Uh, for example, for, for Cal.com, I don't think I'm biased, but I don't think it makes sense to like, start another scheduling solution just because like a single thing doesn't work or a simple a single integration is missing um I, because of all the other things now you have to take care of now you have this like slippery slope of all the different problems and so um yeah a lot of times it's just easier to fix what's broken instead of like restarting from scratch um so but Again, it really depends on your conviction as well. If you want to compete, you, you should compete with, with anyone. You know, you should not be too afraid of larger projects out there. Thanks. Um, maybe something we can go into more. <laughs> later. Sure. Cool. Ben, you want to go next? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, my question was around around when not to go for open source. So now I'm not talking about generally, I'm talking specifically within the stack. Uh, so for example, at my default is open source. I just like it. I enjoy it. I enjoy when other projects are open source. So it's just like it's kind of straightforward for me. But I would like to pick your brain on, do you have a mental model? Like are there some parts of the stack that shouldn't be open source? And how, how do you think about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so I I had this conversation with Omar earlier today, and I don't believe in this kind of like BSD license or the, the, the new license that like Sentry came up with where like you start with a commercial core and after two years or so it becomes freely available. Um, right. Me as a, as a maintainer, I never want to have users be on, a, on an old version because they have bugs, they have security vulnerabilities. So it really doesn't make sense from an open source point of view to say like, oh yeah, it's going to be open source, but like you need to wait two years. Like two years, Calendar mm -hmm. didn't exist, right? Like right. that's the time span we're talking of tech. And so if you are now going to the free, the very first version, it's fucking dog shit. And so um, I don't want that for my for my community. So um, I think that's not an option to start commercial and make it open source at all. I mean, think about how bad ChatGPT would be if it has a two year delay for open source. Yeah, yeah very bad. Yeah. So now the question is, okay, but how do you actually commercialize? And to me, that's open core. I'm a very strong believer in open core because what open core means is you have a 90 something percent freemium code base that like hobbyists or small companies or startups can use for free if they, you know, um, set it up themselves. And, no strings attached. I do like AGPL because it means um, whatever you fork, you need to keep public and contribute back to the community. And the community's work itself is protected as well, which means that if you are a, if you're a contributor and you, you, you don't like Facebook or you don't like Amazon, you can be very sure that like if that company forks the code base that you just contributed to, they won't make like an AWS um, Elasticsearch or, or similar, mm -hmm. right? Like, which happened in the past where just a big corporation comes, takes the MIT code base and makes a commercial product. Like happens all the time. We say literally they can, whatever. So and this, to me, double yeah. Click. So, sorry, I just want to double click on this like open core thing. I, I think mm -hmm. my, to center kind of like this question, like what is the core? What is then the core? How, you have a mental model yeah. to decide what is the core, what is not the core basically. I, yeah, I have a very good mental model. Um, and I, it was partly inspired by Figma, which is by the way, not open source, um, but 
So Figma has a very interesting notion as well and a very interesting um, go-to-market where like every single player feature is free for yourself. But the moment you need to collaborate and you need to pull on your team, that's where, where you need to join an organization, you need to pay mm -hmm. for a seat. And to me, um, when people are looking for open source solutions, they typically have two reasons why. They have maybe a cost attached to it. Uh, there's many other reasons, but let's go and uh, zoom into the, the cost attached to it. And they need something that they maybe can change code or like contribute to a toy around with, learn something. Um, for me as a business, and take a look at Notion and Figma, they're doing great. I don't really see that as a commercial customer, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it's open source or it's closed source, I'm giving it away for free already. So if you can strike that balance, it's really easy to think about, okay, what does an individual hobbyist engineer need? If you're mm -hmm. engineering focused, maybe you're not engineering focused. But then also, what is, a, what is an engineering team? Need? What is a, a marketing team? Need? What is a product team? Need? And so... Um, right. We've made, for us internally, it's a big topic as well, but we have this this thing where we say single player, multiplayer, and like single player is free, um, and then multiplayer is where you pay a SaaS fee, because right. that's where you have collaboration, and for Cal.com, it would be around Robin links and routing and team events and, and all that stuff, and team availabilities and managing that. Um, so from a mental model, it's really easy because um, you, you just say, okay, whatever is single player is free, like take what you want and contribute back. Same with like single sign-on. We don't, we don't have single sign-on in our enterprise license because we hate security. We just don't believe that a single hobbyist needs single sign-on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I, I <laughs> don't. <laughs> Double click one more time into and go again a layer below. Um, so I get the mental model. I think, I think it's amazing. Um, and how do you then like, so does that mean that the Cal.com code base actually the, like, is there really a one-on-one -on -one, like mapping right now on what you told me, uh, like the freemium features and, uh, and the code base that is live and in the public? So is that, is that how um, it is right now? So uh, I would say very much um, as close as we try, you know, there's always, um, there are always components where you'd say, okay, this is something, yes, this could be a single player, but only for the head of, operations at a larger corporation so it's like it's not a multiplayer commercial it's not a multiplayer collaborative feature but mm -hmm. it's definitely not something that you need as an individual hobbyist or single right. mom that like pop store so i do think like advanced um, workflows or routing forms technically you could use that as a standalone person but you would never just wake up one day and be like okay i need this for my side project right mm -hmm. so um and the, the, the reason this mental model works out is because if you, if you were to build this product in closed source, you would probably keep the same mental model as well. It's like, yeah, yeah, sure, how, sure. how do I make my freemium plan? And then how do I make my team's plan, my collaboration plan? And how do I make my enterprise plan, right? Sure, sure. And just to go last one, which I hope will be shorter, a uh, last double click. Um, does that mean like really like technically you have like closed repos that cover those features and then you kind of need to plug everything together from an engineering point of view? You kind of need to uh, deploy everything separate as like microservices or something like this? Yeah, it's a great question. We actually had a similar one last time we talked. So um, the best way to go over this is we have a top level license from a, like a license point of view that says um, everything is AGPL unless the content in these folders, right? And you have these... Right, right, right. Okay. And, and you have these, these commercial enterprise edition EE folder. And so if you go into one of these folders, A, you'll see a different license. You'll also see a different readme. So you have like this enterprise edition and you can get a license key very easily. And then there's a license that is a commercial license. Yeah, beautiful. Um, so yeah. So technically, source it's available, but it's not open source, which is also great for security audits. It's all public, um, but it's and as you can see, you know, we have managed team events, we have organization, we have impersonations, um, we have teams, we have workflows. So it's it's very easy to also take a look at the code base and see, oh, okay, I understand what's uh, what's commercial. What's yeah. Not. yeah, right. That was it. Yeah. Thanks, man. And we've actually, funny enough, we actually have started out with a private fork and said like everything on calenzo.com was our private fork. 
and it had like a little bit more features and things. Um, but it was just such a merging hell. Like long term, it's just way too much overhead, and you're not winning anything, and it feels weird. And you have like, um, uh, for example, when you have people who want to uh, contribute, they don't know what like how do they. I have a bug here, but I don't see the code. Yeah, right? yeah. So you, you had like t t two remotes on Git. Is that how you managed it? Like you were kind of. Uh, I, I don't even. I don't even remember how we did it. But it was horrendous. I do not recommend. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So I, I think even if I would start tomorrow, I would do the same split. And and GitLab has done this, and they went public. So I think it's a proven proven path. Um, they don't have AGPL. That's something that we brought into the mix. They have an MIT license. But other than that, they still have an open source commercial split, open core commercial split. Right, right, right. right. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. But it, again, it's always a, I think that was the hardest struggle for us to get going of like, how can we actually commercialize products without giving them away for free? Um, the side effect is you still publish the code so people technically could take it, rip it out. Um, this has only happened once from a company that, is at a stage where where you could see of like okay well this is actually this is actually bad a lot of times um when people violate licenses and this can be you can make an example with like um uh, someone buys tailwind ui and then privately shares the key or shares the mm -hmm. components right like happens all the time with, because tech is being shared and sometimes you know you just you know close two eyes but the people who do that, they're not commercial large companies. Like a, a, a Microsoft would never by choice violate a license. They, mm -hmm. Like the engineer gets fired, the head of engineering is like, what the fuck's going on? The CFO is in trouble, the head of legal comes in. So like, there's just too much risk to not, to like go away DRM. So the mm -hmm. people you're selling to already are in the, in the camp of, okay, I have to get a license. Otherwise, like I lose my job. The people who are like, oh, I found a way to like rip out all the license code and I can run it without getting a license. That's the people who you're already not charging. And, right, and right. even if you see them online and you see like, oh, they are violating my license, you'll probably reach out to them saying like, hey, how can we make this work? You know, do you, do you, are you low on money? Can we give you a sponsorship? Can we endorse you? What's going on, right? So um, I've never really seen a problem where you are like, oh, but what if they take my commercial code and run with it. Um, sure. Yeah, and, and worst case, you know, um, you have a legal team at a certain size and you just send out a nasty letter and say like, hey, what's going on? Like, please don't, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I have other questions, but I can go next. <laughs> related. <laughs> it's, it's always an interesting topic. But, and I was also, like when I started, I was like, oh, how do I do this? And I was very private with the commercial code and then I sometimes like, this is too much like this is too much effort so yeah cool anything related uh tom or any any other questions ben? to to licensing or getting started or how, how, how do we figure all of that yeah figure all of that out i don't want to use anyone else airtime but I <laughs> <laughs> we all have infinite time all right. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, other question is like around sequencing. If you have an opinion mm -hmm. around like in the beginning, you you, you just uh, you, you have the software. It's an unimpressive, right? In the beginning, it's the same for everyone. But if it's unimpressive and open source, um, and it's not like code for developers, etc. There's like a, a question about how much value are people will pay, people pay for this. Or not so i wonder if like there's a sense to eventually open source rather to you know start open source because of you know at some point you just cross this intersection where value in a value is provided and your thing is complex enough that like yeah, it just reaches this magical inflection point so i don't know if mm. you have to do that um yeah, I, I have a, have a pretty interesting experience with that. Um, we started out with a paid only plan for an open source product, which is very interesting. So um, basically, you have the open source code base, but then every plan we had on the SaaS plan, which we would host, was paid. 
um, when we launched and A, you get revenue, which is great. <laughs> so you know what, if you're building something, people like it, they pay for it. But also you really only attract people who want to be early and gear, like who are good customers. They leave high quality feedback. They feel like they are part of a community. They, they feel like they are very close to your um, product. Um, and you just have less people and you can really double down on their needs and their problems mm -hmm. and their features and their bugs than launching with a prosumer product, which is free. And then you, you have like, first off, you probably have a 90% drop off after like day one of people just signing up and clicking a couple of buttons and leaving again. Um, just because people want to try new things and see if, if it works for them. So, and, and as an engineer or as a, as a founder, the early months and years are very intense and you really want to double down on the people who, who like what you're building. And then eventually you want to figure out how can I find more of these people and then eventually you want to expand your audience and you know, go into more late, later, later stage um, adopters. So I don't know, I, I haven't read anything about it, but it felt really, really right to launch paid only. And then once we had a certain stability and stage of like, okay, now we can actually, we have a support team, we can, you know, fulfill the needs of more people. We, we actually, we made every paid plan free, right? So you get an email and it says like your $15 a month plan is free now. Like mm. that's fucking sick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, go, sure. Like if you, it, and, and we, we did that at a point where we already had like somewhat of enterprise traction where it's like, you're not even losing, you have a small dip, but you're not like exploding in terms of lack of revenue. And it's, it's a really cool email to send because it says like, Hey, like, thank you so much for being part of this, but like you're in it for free now because of these changes. We, we were, we are commercially more access, uh, um, successful in enterprise and, and mid market and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Com companies like us. So here's all your free plan. Um, and it was very interesting because our free plan is as good, if not better, as our competitors' um, pro plans because we don't do the prosumer focus. We say, okay, everything individuals is free, no matter how good that feature is, like mm. infinite calendars, infinite whatever, reminders, workflows, um, links. These are limitations that other people put on you as a free plan and they hope you, you convert to a pro plan. But like from a from an individual point of view, um, it really makes no sense to upgrade if if the alternative is free, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, that's been fantastic for us. Um, I would probably do the same thing again and, and start paid only. Um, it's not Wait, a long term. Paid only, but open source, or paid only and closed source, and then open source. No, no, no. Always open source from the okay. Always open yeah. source, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's interesting also is like you're not really you're not really rejecting people who want to buy a free product because they, they can take the open source review and run it themselves for free. So yeah. it is, it is more steps and you need to understand how Docker works or railway or reverse cell, whatever, but like, you're not really excluding people. And, and, and that way you might even drive more self hoster adoption um, and more contributions because now people are looking into your code and you drive more eyeballs to the self hosted version because um, you don't make it like a one click free plan on your website, on your SaaS plan. So it's like, if you want to go fast, pay us. If you want to set up the repo locally, get going and set up yourself, you can always go free. Actually, that touches on a good segue into another question, which is like, yeah, if everything is super easy to deploy, um, especially in the beginning, then it's like, and then you have not that much to deploy and you click with railway. Um, I mean, I was like thinking, do you do that in, in the beginning? Do you give this one click deploy or you just, should you wait a little bit to give this option to people? Because I want people to deploy my thing, but eventually, eventually. <laughs> um, no, so we, we have a, a two command um, line to get it up and running locally and probably like a three command to run on a server. Mm -hmm. The reason being is, um, and I thought about this as well, whether other people do that or not, but like, I think you really want to make it as easy as possible to get going with your software um, because of contributions, but also eventually you have paying customers and they pay you for a license mm -hmm. and they don't want to be dealing with all that hustle. Right. So for mm -hmm. us, time TTV, right. Time to value 
has to be as short as possible. So like we, we, we have had like deploy in Brazil, deploy in Heroku, rest in peace uh, in the very early days, um, just because we wanted it to make super easy. The only caveat is a lot of these platforms are so fucking different that like a lot of these deploy buttons um, stop working eventually. Uh, mm -hmm. And so you need to put in a lot of testing and community help to keep them up to date, you know, when like environment variables change or how large a serverless function can be like every, ser every service has yeah, to be. Right, 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 right. So that's been, that's been something which we've been somewhat been really struggling with um, because of how quick our system works. And, you know, we can only test on our infra really like we, we can't have, you know, 10 yeah, deployments. Sure. And so some people were like, oh, I clicked the button, but I got an error. And I'm like, oh, fuck, Kuroko shut down, you know, like, <laughs> fuck that. So that's something to be mindful of. Yeah. Sure. But that's also something you can outsource to the community. If you find someone who's like a Heroku fanboy or a Rayway fanboy and you tell them like, please click this button every two months and let me know if it still works. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we still haven't done all the buttons, but by now we have a lot of buttons that deploy Cal. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, Tom, are you going to go next? Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. You're yeah, muted. Oh, there you go. I'm muted. <laughs> it's me. I don't know. Sorry. Yeah. You, you I, can, I, yeah. Okay. Okay. So going back to the license, uh, do you use like some type of software that do the tracking of some infringement of those those licensing or, or no mm -hmm. a we we actually we did have um telemetry baked into the product into the code base initially with a way to easily remove it of course with like an environment variable um i don't remember if it was opt in or opt out but we i i do think we actually removed it because it was kind of buggy i don't think we've brought it back um so we have somewhat of an idea who hosts cal.com on their domain because it just you can report like i'm using this on my own whatever the domain we've never really invested time to see if they actually have a license or not as i said before the large companies don't violate and the small ones you don't charge um there's probably a, a ton of people that we don't charge like probably but the the total amount of revenue is, is neglectable to like a single enterprise deal that we close. I think I saw a I think I saw a statistic from from GitLab's um, last quarter or maybe two quarters ago, where like ninety ish somewhat percent came from like the top one percent of customers, and the rest of the ten percent came from the rest of the ninety or something. Maybe eighty twenty. I mean, typical Pareto stuff, but. That was really like unsurprising to me um, how to me prosumer doesn't really work and like mid market and I mean just think about like to make a like how many subscribers you need to make a million a year in revenue like that's just fucking insane right? like if you have a prosumer product like I've seen SaaS apps where it's like three or five dollars a month and I'm like <laughs> are you gonna have like I don't know two hundred thousand paid subscribers? Like that's fucking rough. And so um, yeah, I, I've never been a big fan. Like especially once you build something that um, people really really want and like and, and are comfortable with. Um, companies are nothing else than a bunch of individuals collectively sitting in one room or remotely. So I try to get like six figure deals coming in very early, you know, like starting at like a hundred something, maybe 75 K in the beginning, going up to like 150 or so. Um, and you also need to really be comfortable, comf com uh, confident in your product that maybe you raise some funding and you have some runway, but like, I would rather start the enterprise or like, you know, six figure sales muscle earlier than later because you need to learn so much as a founder that like, if you postpone it, you just postpone your learning and you probably get a ton of rejections initially, but at least they reject you because of the price or maybe because you're not like early enough. And then that way you just reach back to them a year later and say like, Hey, listen, like we're one year older, we're still growing and, and we are 20% cheaper now because of X, Y, Z. 
uh, or maybe you're more expensive because you have more features, right? Um, so as long as they reject you based on like, you're not old enough and you're like um, too pricey or so, that's good reasons. If you want to be rejected because your product is shit, right? And then you make your product better. Um, but if that's the two reasons, I wouldn't like, yeah, I would just go for enterprise way, way earlier than others. Yeah. If you have a commercial open source product that makes sense for that market, right? Yeah. yeah okay. 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 Sounds good. Tom, you want to go next? Yeah, yeah sure. That, that's, I think the community building is an interesting part, especially if you're not building a developer tool. So okay. how do you build a community for non-developers tool software? I think cal.com kind of falls into that category as well. Yeah, it's kind of like, how do you define non-tech? Because today I think every industry, like there's not like tech and non-tech, like non-tech to me is like people using a fax machine, but like if you're a carpenter, you probably have a CRM of people. If you are a dentist, you probably have a dentist booking system. If you are a whatever, come up with an industry, a yoga teacher. So like, I do think every industry has its own set of engineers and maybe it's an agency that sells to these industries, but um, I don't really know any industry where tech does, is, does not play a larger role in it. And so you always have somewhat of people who are in that industry interested in that. Um, especially now with low code and no code and Zapier and all that stuff, as long as you have these kind of like integrations into Zapier and, and uh, N8N and, and, and make, um, like we have lawyers who have never written a line of code, but like embedded our embed into their WordPress page. So, um, yeah, I think everyone, not GitHub, I get you that. So like GitHub is mostly for engineers. But I do think that um, you can build in any industry because any industry has technical people. So it's just a matter of like how big is that industry. Yeah, um, just I agree. Um, and the the developer community on GitHub is probably harder, and maybe approached differently because I feel like if it's like a very technical solution, like I don't know, Bun, uh, it's a very technical tool. Um, Hyping up a community about it, for example, is much faster. All that is pr much easier, yeah. assume, um, compared to uh, like a calendar solution. Like, where, where, of, there are a lot of technical challenges, but maybe mm. not as obvious or as exciting for developers. So, how do you get developers excited? And I think I, 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 I would even say the opposite is true. I think very few people are skilled enough and interested enough in really, really hard engineering problems such as BUN or, is, or uh, what is the programming language called? Zip? No, or something similar. Zig. 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 Um, like, sure, technical problems attract technical people. But I think, you know, so many of us work in industries where you deal with time zones, where you deal with uh, digital signing, like documents or, or um, forms or um, uh, workflows or whatever. Um, Salesforce alternative 20 is a, is a great CRM as well. So I think people want to be, people just want to work on interesting problems and interesting problems show up in any industry. Um, you can probably launch a open source, um, uh, analytics product for wind parks, right? And you would attract, you know, the freaks of the wind park industry that like just die hard about your solution. It's a smaller niche, but nonetheless it exists and, and people will, you know, like for example, we have 500 something, maybe 600 um, contributors and part of them care about calendars, but part of them also only care about like hard engineering problems. and. You, you have them in most industries, so you don't need to be very technical. You don't need to work on like a database like Superbase or, or BUN or um, whatever, TRPC to be, to be an interesting GitHub project. And I also, last thing, I also think the more technical problems are actually way, way harder to monetize because you're pretty much always only working with engineers and engineers don't want to buy things. <laughs> And because we're just used to like yarn install 
anything or bum install anything and we're like oh it's free you know someone has made it why should i pay for it um and so if you're just a package if you're just um a runtime i i mean kudos to bun I'm, I'm very happy for for the them to to exist and we're really trying hard to get bun integrate well, to run calacom on bun but um trpc as well it's like it's a really hard um product to monetize really because it's it's it, or react like who the fuck monetizes react facebook won by far because of their tech influence and their hiring potential and unifying their tech stack among apps like i think that's the biggest driver of this but like i don't think you can really charge for react like imagine you as a developer would need to pay a license for that right so or typescript yeah, <laughs> or typescript like no uh, well, <laughs> don't see that being successful so I'm a, I'm a big fan of, um, me and JJ called it AppFra, where it's like you, you build an application and you sell the infrastructure. And this is true for, it's also true for private company, closed source companies. You could make the argument that open AI's chat GPT is, is a great example of AppFra because they have a free, almost free consumer facing app. And then they sell the API to any developer for on a per token business model, right? And to me, um, they are only as successful in the developer space because of all the brand and, and also all the improvements done by the community, by the consumers, right? So for us, we, we didn't start selling the infrastructure to larger companies before we had like a million bookings done by consumers, right? And so we were comfortable saying like, okay, whatever we sell to a business will work because of we've tested almost every edge case. Um, and so if you have a pure developer product and you're only selling to developers i think you're also only charging developers and so that's something which i find very interesting as an industry um me personally i really like appfra like building free apps and selling infrastructure um that's been really fun um maybe on that note uh, also interesting would it but you, I think we talked about it before, but approaching like individuals and charging them in the beginning might be good, but in the long run, not really worth it. Um, so is it maybe a, so a strategy to say, okay, right from the beginning, we approach bigger corporations and enterprises, we try to get deals with them, maybe even before we have the actual product. And then with the more guaranteed revenue, uh, build and invest in that. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, selling to companies is interesting, or larger companies is interesting because the lead time is taking time. So you, you can start selling before it's ready, but um, eventually you need to do demos and, and get procurement on them and, and, and build, like give them a trial and, and handhold them. So, like, um, and also the biggest your biggest enemy starting a project is actually your immaturity as a company no matter how good the product is a, a buyer looks at your company and says how many engineers do you have how big is the team can you sign an sla do you have a support team can, can we do redlining who's your lawyer who's your ex who's your what's your insurance and so your biggest enemy is actually time like even if you have all of those they'll look back in your company registration or they ask you and say, okay, yeah, we're like six months old. And they'd be like, all right, okay, let's come back in two years. So like that happens a lot. We're, we're now closing a lot of contracts that we've been in conversations for two years, just because the buying person is another employee who just doesn't want to lose their job, right? They don't have any incentive to move fast. They have an incentive to keep their job. And so, for them to take a risk they don't reap the benefit a founder reaps the benefit if a founder takes a new product and and gets a 50 percent performance boost that's awesome or saves i don't know 20 percent of, of of costs but if a generic you know procurement manager or or head of even head of engineering or head of product from a larger company as you said like looks at your product they just see risk they don't see the upside and so your enemy is really time. And, and the way you beat that is to have a good shipping cycle. We have a 
monthly cadence of every 15th of the month, by the way, in nine days, um, go, go sub subscribe on Product Hunt. In every 15th of the month, we launch a version and we let the person know, here's a new version. Here's what's better, faster, cheaper. And, and that way you keep them in the loop and then eventually they realize, oh, wow, you have SOC 2, ISO, HIPAA, um, all of that stuff. And you have like several um, existing customers who have testimonials and all that stuff. And then, they, then the buying decision is very easy. But if you're just getting started, it's really hard. You still should try. You should still jump on every call and learn as much as you can and build the features that people want to pay for. But like, don't think you can like make revenue early by like closing an enterprise deal upfront <laughs> and then not having a product ready. So that's, that's really hard. Thank you. At least from my experience. There's probably people who yeah. pull that off. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. There are more questions, but I think so we have times. three more minutes. Yeah. Um, it was pretty quick. It was a quick, quick uh, session this time. Felt like uh, time's flying. Um, anyone has a final burning question before you go to sleep? No. Oh, yes, you're up. Okay, so uh, so going back to my first question, I, I don't know if I got it or, but what I was trying to say is going open source, wouldn't it eliminate the possibility or make it much, much harder to maybe sell the company oh, or, or even yeah. or even mm -hmm. for investors, like getting a seed round or stuff? Mm. So, yeah, yeah, I, I remember postponing that question. Um, good thing you brought it up again. Um, I have not felt any problems raising. Uh, I mean, also was a different market, but even today, I think open source companies can can very raise. I mean, it's one of the largest um, uh, one of the largest industries in YC right now, and I think YC is a good training indicator of what investors like to invest in. Um, it's a good startup index, and so I would not be afraid of investors when it comes to M and A. Um, I think that the industry is just very young. I know open source is very old, but I think commercial open source is very young. So we haven't really seen much M&A or, or IPOs besides, you know, GitLab and I mean, there's many others. I'm not saying there's none, but like when it comes to SaaS, I think there's a lot more. Um, it, um, it really depends what the mindset of the buyer is like whether they understand open source. I think a lot of companies understand the power of open source and acquire open source because of its open sourceness. When you deal with a traditional buyer that has no idea about open source, they probably see it as a risk. But to be honest, as a founder, do you want to be selling to that type of person in the first place? Like maybe if your company is dying, so you take any deal. And if your company is dying, you probably leave on bad terms so the company who's acquiring the company the open source code base will do whatever they want anyway like so they take it private they commercial like they change the license they kick you out you have no controlling stake in the company anymore so if you're winning no one cares if you're losing you're losing anyway so like um yeah i i don't think i've ever seen someone being afraid of buying an open source code base to be honest um I could, if anything, if you're successful and open source, I think you have a very, very strong mode because you're the only one doing something. Um, open source has very strong network effects. Like think about Next.js, right? Like if Vercel, eventually, whatever, is being bought by something, they buy probably the largest React framework ever in history um, with the largest community. Like you would probably pay a really, really decent dime to to get that much uh, engineers right um so i don't i'm not concerned if you're winning i think you're in a very good position and then if you're doing if you're going sideways or losing you probably are in a bad the in a bad place whether you're open source or not <laughs> so yeah it's very very bipolar yeah. for fundraising there's probably people who don't understand open source and they won't ever want to talk to you but you won't don't want them on your cap table anyway like it's a good filter. So. Makes sense. Thank you. Cool. All right. I think that's a good way to end uh, this stream. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, do subscribe again. There's uh, more coming next week.
uh, I think next week. Um, and yeah, have a follow on Algora. Thank you for hosting us. <laughs> All right, take care, everyone. Bye. Good Bye. Again. Bye.